there, but it says, a therefore, at the beginning of chapter 5. And it's actually three therefores in chapter 5. So every time you have a therefore, it's because of the previous thing. Isn't that right? So therefore is talking about previous. And so every time you see a therefore, it's kind of like, um, it's like another step up. It's like a staircase that you're going from stepping off that foundation of that, um, what you've already read, onto another step of what has been previous done is doing for the next bit. Does that does it make sense to you? That what the previous step's foundation is, is taking you to another step, but because of the previous things that you've read. And, uh, you know, we finished that last Sunday, if you remember, if you were here. Um, and Celia said at the end of it, which I didn't mention, um, that the previous verse, the, la the verse, last verse in, in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, is actually saying that he was betrayed and put to death because of our misdeeds, and was raised to secure our justification and our acquittal, absolving us from all guilt and making our account balanced. Do you remember that verse? I've been hammering away at this verse for weeks. Do you remember that verse, the last verse of chapter 4? But she said at the end of it, she said, I don't think anybody heard or maybe did, that that verse is there because God was pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead meant God was sat very, very pleased with the sacrifice. It also meant that Jesus had never sinned because he could never rise if he had committed one sin. So in the context of that, his blood was unstained by sin. So, but the theme of what Siddhi was saying was that God was pleased. This shows us that God was pleased with the sacrifice and it was enough for us, that the fact that he rose from the dead. You think about it. God was pleased. Jesus rose from the dead. We are cleansed from sin and we're justified and we're going to heaven. Well, because of him, isn't that nice? And so the therefore here is like in chapter... Five, verse 1, immediately after that, with um, the break of the chapter. Therefore, since we are justified and declared in a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have peace, the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy peace with God. So the therefore is saying, because of all that, and the acquittal on Jesus' resurrection and being justified, we have peace. Amen. We're on another step. We've gone up a step from looking about how we're justified, we've gone up a step to being in peace. Hallelujah. Are you in peace? Have we got peace? This is telling us that we have peace because of that. I think that's amazing. Do you like that? I like it. And that makes me excited about the Book of Romans. And it just gets better and better and better and better. And here's a whole gem of stuff that could be lying on our, on our bookcase and we've never opened it and explored it. And it's just there waiting for us to open up and be encouraged by it. Amen. You don't even have to have me here. You just can go to your Bible, open it up and be encouraged. That's good news. Hallelujah. You like? I like. So we have peace. How much peace do you see missing in this present situation? World situation, New Zealand situation, in your family situation. Well, we can have peace in spite of. Now, the next verse is are amazing, but I wondered if we could read them not as a us, because it talks about us all through these verses. Us. It's always us. 
if through him we have our by faith into this grace, the state of God's favour, which we firmly and safely stand. Let us rejoice and exhort in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. Hey, that's nice. But what happened if you read through this here and took us out and put I? How would it sound? Well, it's the same time, instead of me reading through it twice, instead of, instead of reading through it uh, um, twice, once with the us and the other with I, we're just going to go ahead and read it as I. How would that go? Mm -hmm. Through him I have access by his grace into this favour. And let me rejoice and exalt in my hope of experience and enjoying the glory of God. Moreover, let me exalt and exalt in my troubles and rejoicing in my sufferings, knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patient and swerving endurance. And endurance develops maturity of character. And character of this sort produces joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. Such hope never disappoints or deludes me or shames me. For God's love has been poured out in my heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to me. While we were yet in weakness and powerless to help us save, when, while I was yet weakless and powerless to self, help myself, at the fitting time, Christ died for me. For the ungodly, actually says here. Christ died for the ungodly. Now it is an extraordinary thing for one to give his life, even for an upright man, even though perhaps for a noble and enjoyable, uh, lovable, generous benefactor, someone may dare to die for. But God shows and clearly proves his own love for me by the fact that we, while I was still a sinner, Christ the Messiah died for me. Therefore we are now justified, made righteous and brought into right standing. Therefore I am now justified, quitted, made righteous and brought into right standing with, Christ, with God by Christ's blood. How much more certain is it that I shall be saved by him from the indignation and wrath of God? You know, that's quite amazing, isn't it? And if, you actually, if you actually say I there instead of us, it actually comes into your heart more than us, because us is broad, but I means I, and me means me. So it, I think it goes in deeper, makes, makes it sort of happen. So I, I just thought that that is showing us, in spite of all the pressures that are on us, that we can have joy and hope in experiencing the glory of God. It says, moreover, let me be full of joy, exult and triumph in my troubles, and rejoice in my sufferings, knowing that the affliction and hardship produce patience, and unswerving endurance. So if you're going through suffering, it's, it's, it's creating endurance. And hey, as much as we kind of don't, don't like that happening, the suffering bit, it actually is doing something. It actually is doing something for us. And so if you were to look it around the other way, hey, that means that something good's happening in spite of this. This is doing something to me. Even though I wouldn't like to have it happening, it's doing something and it's giving me an endurance. I'm a long distance runner now. I'm not just a sprinter, I'm a long distance runner. I can endure a longer, longer time. I can endure. I can go the long, the long distance. You ever seen those coast to coast, the endurance thing? Hell, that's so horrific how they do that.
It's a beautiful picture of while we were still sinners, but Christ didn't. Talking in verse 8. While we were still sinners, Christ loved us so much that he died for us. I think we've all started off as sinners because we all had that condition. We all had that condition. We couldn't escape it. So Christ died for us when we were in that condition. When the sin factor was not taken away by Christ out of our lives by accepting him as saviour. So we're all in that category, aren't we? His blood is a leveller. Jesus' blood is a leveller. We can't take any credit to ourselves how good we were, how bad we were, how good we were. Now, I've said this before at this church, that I heard the story of this girl, that she lived a perfect life, perfect, perfect life. She didn't do anything wrong. She just lived a perfect life. But she said in that perfection, she was just as so far away from God as if she'd been the worst sinner in the world. She was so far away from God in that condition, even though she did live perfectly. She's still so far away. Isn't that amazing? She said when she came to Christ, she came, she came to that place where she con connected with God. I think it's a good story because it shows us that our own goodness doesn't get us near God. Is that right? Does that make sense? Um, so, the only way we can get to God is through having faith in Jesus Christ. And then actually, this verse here, verse 9, since we are now justified, since I am now justified, or you are now justified and brought into a relationship with God by Christ's blood, how much more certain is that we shall be saved by him from the indignation and wrath of God. Hey, listen, that is probably something that jars us right there. But actually, if that's true, Christ has saved us from God's wrath. Which is kind of like, shows us how important it is to be saved. Doesn't it? Really. If, if Christ, it says here, that we shall be saved by him being Jesus from the indignation and wrath of God. I don't think that was put in there by chance or a mistake. I think that's true. We need salvation. Because, because the other side of the coin doesn't look good when I read this verse. And I don't think we should fool ourselves about this. I think we need to take notice of what the Bible says and look at it. If you look at this carefully, you will realise how amazingly blessed we are. How amazingly blessed we are. Because the other side of the coin, the being not saved, is, is, is not good, according to this verse. Is it? I think it actually, I actually think sometimes in Christians' lives, we need to, need to be tidied up from being lulled into a, a, a sort of a, a false picture of what it's all about. I honestly do. And I think this verse shows us the consequences of not being of not being saved. Of not being saved by his blood. Of not taking hold of the Saviour when he's presented that this Saviour is the absolute answer to avoiding God's wrath. I believe that we're in a time of grace where God's where, where God is by his love is calling everybody. It's by, well, while there is time. While there is time. Time for salvation. Amen. So this is an amazing chapter. Because it tells me what it's like when, what, what it was like to get to where we got. And the, and the mechanism, how it worked. We shall be saved and delivered from, for he, for if while, I'll go to we now because it's awkward to transfer this into I. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more certain now that we are reconciled, 
that we shall be saved daily from sin's dominion through his resurrected life. Resurrection life. Jesus' resurrection. Not only that, but we also rejoice and exalt, exultingly glory in God in the love, in his love and perfection through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now receive and enjoy our reconciliation. Hey, we've been reconciled. Say, I'm reconciled. I'm reconciled. Therefore, as sin come into the world through one man, and death as a result of sin, so death spread to all men. Not one being was able to stop it or to escape its power because all men sinned. This whole thing came through one man, Adam, didn't it? And because of that one man, nobody could stop that sin effect of spreading to another man. And by the way, these two words sin here are not actually sinning, but it's actually the, 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 the um, thing that comes into human being's spirit, that uh, thing called sin. It's a condition. That's what that's talking about there. So the condition spread from Adam to all men. Amen. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged to men's account where there is no law. That didn't make sense. Yet death held sway from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not themselves transgress. A positive command, as Adam did. Adam was a tight prefigure of the one who was to come. One was a one was the former was destructive, and the latter, which was like the latter Adam, which was Jesus, was saving. But God's free gift is not at all to be compared to the trans trespass. His grace is out of all proportion to the fall of man. For if, if many died through one man's falling away, his offence much more profusely did God's grace and free will come through the undeserved favour of the one man Jesus. Christ abounded and Christ, Jesus Christ abound and it overflowed to all for the benefit of men. So it's saying there that the what God did for us is out of all proportion to the sin. So what I'm doing this for is that when you're in a situation and you're pondering about sin and grace you have to look at the power of the superabundant out of all portion of grace that God has over sin. Is that encouraging? Mm -hmm. Well, it's encouraging for me anyway. It's really encouraging. Because it's out of all proportion. And if you go away and you think of a set of balances like this next week, next year, bring back the picture of how fantastic God's grace is. You know, I, I think grace is God's nature. I believe God, grace is God's nature. And he was put into a corner by the sin of man to do something about it, man's sin, so that his extremity of his nature could be revealed to man. And the only way he could do it was pay the price through Jesus. So now in his grace... We're looking at the extremity and the, the goodness of God's nature. It's really fantastic. It's not at all now, nor is the free gift at all to be compared with the effect of one man's sin. For the sentence, the trespass, one man brought condemnation, whereas the free gift following many transgressions brings justification. An act of righteousness. Because if for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace, his unmerited favour, and the free gift of righteousness 
putting themselves into freestanding with himself, reign as kings in life through Jesus Christ. An amazing verse. His unmerited favour. Much more surely. Good words, aren't they? So, I actually, I've now got the grace, the, the weight of grace has outweighed the, the power of sin, Adam's sin. It says we will reign. We will reign. We are reigning in spite of our circumstances. There's three things mentioned in this chapter of reigning. That we reign, sin reigns, and grace reigns. Well then, as um, in verse 18, well then, as one man's trespass, false step, and falling away led to condemnation for all people, <coughs> one man, so one man's act of righteousness, acquittal, and right standing with all, for all men. For just as one man's disobedience, failing to hear, um, many were constituted sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be constituted righteous and made acceptable to God and brought into right standing with Him. Then the law came in as to expand and increase the trespass. This is going back, way back um, when the law was given. And made it more apparent and exciting, and exciting opposition. But where sin increased and abounded, God's unmerited favour has su surpassed it and increased the more and superabounded. I like it. It says here that where sin, about, where sin increased, God's, God's grace has surpassed it and increased the more and superabounded. So it's saying there that when sin increased, so it, sin's abounding here, right? Was abounding here. God's grace has superabounded over sin. Thank you, Lord. Even when sin increased. You know, sin cannot increase. I believe this that sin cannot increase to the point that God's grace cannot over superabound overabound it. Cannot superabound over it, right? It, it makes me look at a, a world through different eyes because I look at it. Um, the, I could look at it with the hopelessness and judgmental of all the things that are happening, but I have to look at it through God's, what it says here, that God's grace can superabound over the, the increase of sin. I like the last verse there. We'll just, so that just as sin has reigned to death, grace, God's unmerited unearned and undeserved favour might reign also through righteousness. It says that sin reigned. Actually, I think I see it reigning around the world, do you? I think I do see that happening. It's reigning. But God's grace can over, can actually, can, it says here, so his grace may reign also through righteousness. God's grace can reign. In spite of sin reigning, we just need to take the, I don't know what the steps are, to get the grace of God reigning into people's lives. Hey. So we have those three reigning things. We can reign, we reign in Christ. Sin can reign. It was reigning. But Jesus has come. And now grace can reign. You like to go away from here and think, Grace reigns. Grace reigns in my life. Everybody I talk to, whether they, if they don't believe, grace is wanting to reign in their life. Grace is wanting to reign in their life. If we could get this message across, wouldn't it make a difference? If people responded to this message, what a difference it would make. Anyway.
So, that's good news. What do you think of that? Yeah. Good. Very true. Very, very good.